Welcome to Between Product and Partnerships, a podcast focused on bringing together product, partnership, and engineering leaders to discuss how to build, support, and scale SaaS ecosystems. Presented by the SaaS Ecosystem Alliance and sponsored by Pandium, an integration platform and marketplace for ecosystems. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening in. Uh, For those of you that are new to our podcast, welcome. I'm Liz Garcia. I'm one of the community managers of the SaaS Ecosystem Alliance, and I'm also on the marketing team at Pandium. Today, I'm speaking with Rich O'Connell, who is the head of partner growth at Atlassian and who has been working um, on product partnerships at Atlassian for a little over a decade. So really excited to uh, hear about his experience and learn more from him. Um, So thanks for taking the time, Rich. Can you share a little bit about Atlassian, yourself, and your background and in tech and product partnerships in particular? Yeah, uh, happy to. And and thanks for the invite to come and talk today. Hopefully some folks in the community find it helpful. Um, So yeah, I work on the product partnerships team here. I've been at Atlassian for about five years working on kind of strategic and integration partnerships. Um, For folks who aren't familiar with Atlassian, we build products that help folks kind of plan, organize, and deliver their work. We're likely best known for Jira Software and Confluence, but we've launched uh, a a number of shiny new products recently. So highly recommend folks check out Jira Service Management and Atlas, um, which were launched recently and are pretty cool. Awesome. So as I mentioned, you've been uh, working in the product partnership space for a really long time. What are some things that you noticed that have changed um, and over the years, but also have remained constant or consistent? Yeah, I, I feel older when when we start talking about decades in a <laughs> particular industry. I think um, I think some of the interesting things that have changed over the past couple of years are kind of the move from single products to platforms. You know, it's a it's a more complicated operating environment, but also it allows for much more powerful integrations. You're looking at things like identity and how you can kind of pep salt and pepper integrations across your products as opposed to just in a small part of, you know, maybe one or two screens. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I think also just the the consumerization of of B2B software, you know, users' expectations are a lot higher now. You know, okay is not good enough. Things need to have a good user experience. They need to be fast. They need to be intuitive. Um, That's been a big change. And then also, I think, you know, what is often called the Cambrian explosion of SaaS apps or just the fact there are so many B2B SaaS apps out there and being adopted now. It's not just one or two or three people in an ecosystem that you need to have relationships and integrations with. There's a much like larger palette of folks to work with now, which is, you know, gr- great for folks who work in, in the partnerships area broadly. Um, I think things that have stayed the same you know, the, the need to focus on customers, you know, they need to be front and center at all points. And, you know, that focus really helps cut through a lot of the noise, you know, in, in partnerships. And then, you know, the currency that we all work in is trust, you know, so how do you keep customer trust? How do you keep trust between your partners? How do you keep trust with the internal teams that you're working with? So, there are two things that I that, that I see staying consistent for the next, you know, forever effectively. Yeah, hundred percent. I definitely agree with your point about the consumers and just integrations. Now they're not a nice to have; they're a need to have in the buying decisions of users. Um, so yeah, and I think that was a a great segue into the conversation that we're going to have today. Yeah. Um, so starting with building those partnerships. There can also there can all there can be a lot of excitement around a new partnership yeah. um, and just wanting to get things th- get things going. What do you suggest that partner managers kind of stay, take a step back um, and objectively assess uh, before going into a partnership to just get ahead of potential problems? Yeah, I mean new new partnerships are awesome. You know, they're one of one of my favorite parts of this job. You know, it often involves a lot of brainstorming and that's when you get to be creative and you can throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, I think like to not get too carried away, it's really important to come back to your motivations for the partnership. Like what's the customer problem you're trying to solve? What's the customer need that's been flagged that the partnership can help? And 
you know, not get too carried away and just help shape some of those discussions. Um, I think like evaluating structural differences between potential partners is helpful. So like, do you go to market in the same way? Do you go to market using different channels? You know, is one of you very enterprise focused and one of you more focused on, on smaller customer segments? They're all things that can be helpful to kind of double click on early in the relationship. Um, are there differences in, in how you develop your products? So are you both going to kind of work towards a, an integration MVP? Is there an expectation that it's far more you know, feature rich and closer to a gold master before you actually re release it into customers. So again, they're all things that can, you know, cause challenges down the road unless you actually think about them. Um, also, you know, are, are your products actually complementary? You know, it can be very tempting to look at kind of the large companies with a center of gravity in a particular area and think, hey, this would be great if we attach their brand to theirs. But if your users aren't going to use both of your products kind of simultaneously or in a way that the integration makes sense, then, you know, a partnership or at least a product partnership might not be the right way to go. Um, and then also just have a look at the teams on both sides. You know, are there are there gaps in skill sets? Uh, is one group very mature and one group, you know, just kind of finding their feet? Um, so, you know, things like that can be helpful to, to look at early on. And obviously everything can be managed and mitigated if you get ahead of it. That's a really good thought framework to think through. Um, one thing I'm also thinking about is partnering when you're looking at potential partnerships, considering competitors or not mm -hmm. automatically counting out competitors as being yeah. a potential product uh, partner. Um so what are your thoughts on partnering with competitors? How do you suggest beginning to even establish that relationship and yeah. maybe some of the differences uh, between structuring this type of partnership versus others? Yeah, it's a, it's a great topic. There's a quote I like here by um, someone called Jim, Jim Barksdale, who used to run Netscape. He once said the, the only way to make money in business or software is bundling and unbundling. And I think that's really true in, in SaaS, you know, the, the constant M&A, the constant release of features. I mean, if you look at a company like Microsoft, they have Office, they have Teams, they have GitHub, they have LinkedIn, they have Minecraft, they have Dynamics. And, you know, they're not an outlier. There, there's lots of companies there now that have a kind of product that that serves multiple segments. So like a, a modern reality is you're going to have to partner with folks that you're competitive with in some areas. Um, I think things that kind of can help um, keep that process moving forward is, again, really focus on your shared customers. So focus on the things that are similar as opposed to the areas that you, you might be competitive in. I think also just assume good intent, you know, People just want to do good work. They want to do the right thing for their customers. They want to make their products, you know, you know, more attractive for those customers. So again, just try and focus on what you're both trying to do, what your, your joint North Star is and how you can kind of help each other. I think also like using the, the, mo the more data you can in the process. So like really going deep on, okay, how many customers do we share? What segments are they in? What kind of feedback have we had around demand for this integration or this partnership? And, you know, focusing on the data can really help kind of cut through any more qualitative, you know, pushback or, or questions or concerns you might get from kind of either side or internal teams. And then, you know, just be creative, start small. It doesn't need to be some kind of a big bang. That's this industry changing thing. Maybe you just start by going to each other's events and, you know, building some relationships with folks. But, um, you know, sometimes from kind of those small initial steps, more interesting things can develop. So really focusing on the data um, and the customers. You kind of touched on this a little bit towards the end, but um, if there's, for example, some internal resistance to partnering with a competitor, how are some, what are some ways that you would suggest building that relationship or trust internally, um, but also building trust with the competitor as well that you're looking to partner with. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, another good topic. I think like like be open and transparent as much as possible. Like like rad radically candid to to use a buzzword. Um, like don't shy away about talking about the areas you're competitive. You know, note them. You know, let people know that you know maybe there are areas that you won't be able to collaborate or areas that are kind of out of bounds for discussion, and that's okay. You know, sometimes naming it can kind of take the power out of it. I think lead by example, you know, be willing to make the first step, you know, be willing to, as I said, kind of share what you're trying to do, share why you're trying to do it, be consistent in the messages you're conveying to kind of all of the different parties. It can also be helpful to kind of point to previous partnerships that have happened in this space. So, you know, you can go to, to one of these folks and say, hey, I love what you did with X, Y, and Z. You know, how would we go about doing something like that? And, and again, using those kind of analogous examples can help people get their head around things that might be, um, you know, less tangible initially and, and point to what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. That's um, great advice for starting to establish that trust or that rapport. Um, are there any areas specifically that you've seen over the years where when it comes to building um, trust in a partnership? What are some areas that you tend to see partner relationships struggle the most? I mean, as I mentioned, like the currency partnerships teams work in is trust. And, you know, the partnership is going to struggle when when any of that phrase in any way. So like common common things that may happen are like, are you not able to execute in a commitment? Um unfortunately sometimes again you can get carried away and over promise and under deliver you know they can be challenging situations i think like the the regular kind of run of business stuff people understand that things change you know roadmaps change you know people leave or have vacation or there's something else unplanned and i think as long as there's a a reason for things to have changed everyone can kind of understand it I think it's more in those areas where like either you haven't done your own due diligence and you don't know your own business and your own business cycles well enough. Or, as I said, we've kind of overcommitted to something, um, you know, maybe with the best of intentions, but it, it's always better to try and kind of under promise and over deliver. So like just the common reasons for things going wrong. Um, but again, if someone hasn't done their own internal due diligence, that can cause issues. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had my last interview with a partner manager at Ryder, and they actually have like this health audit score for all of their partnerships. Uh, and the relationships section was the one that's weighted the most out of all of them, because to your point, like that responsiveness, trust yeah. and relationship with the partner is the foundation of all the other work. Um, I, I, maybe, maybe to build on that as well is like it's always good to have a few people at a partner that you have relationships with you know obviously if you're only uh you know working very closely with one person whether it's like their bd team or their partnerships team if they leave and you have to effectively rebuild a relationship that can be you know it can really slow things down so it's always good to have two or three folks that you're chatting to yeah that's great advice um, it's kind of shift gears a little bit. I saw something really interesting in one of your, your blog posts about, um, where you had mentioned that having executive alignment, um, when building a new partnership is a nice to have, but shouldn't be a deal breaker to move forward in a partnership. Um, I thought that was interesting because I feel like I've often heard of the struggles that partner managers or partnerships teams have with getting a executive alignment. Um, and investment. So can can you explain a little bit about why you feel this shouldn't be a deal breaker and how partner partner managers or leaders can work around this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to like understanding how your company likes their executives to function. You know, some companies are a, a little more top down and that kind of the execs get brought in early and they kind of bless the partnership. And then everyone else kind of goes and executes. Other companies are more bottoms up where the kind of partnerships teams kind of effectively get to make a lot of their own decisions. 
And in that case, execs are usually only brought in if there is an escalation or a challenge or maybe a relationship that needs to be repaired somehow. So I think it really comes down to like how your company operates. Then there's obviously kind of the other side of the house, which is how your partner's company like to operate. So, you know, I've seen instances in the past where, um, you know, a, a partner team won't really engage unless there's been a short exec briefing or kind of, you know, even just kind of a handshake type session. And if you feel like there's enough value in the partnership to make that happen, then fine, go and make it happen. Like I think what I what I've found in working with executive teams is that they're more than happy to help in any way you can, they can, as long as you can kind of show the the value that's going to be be delivered by engaging them. So, and I, I I've I've never seen a partnership fail because of a lack of executive relationship or a lack of even alignment at an executive level. So. You know, I think all of these ways can work um, and it's just about learning like what your team, you know, likes to be engaged in and what your partner's team needs to be engaged in. Mm. You have written about on, on your blog about communicating with executives when a mm. partnership yeah. does need help. What approaches have you found successful or helpful there? Yeah, I'm I'm far from the expert um, <laughs> here, but a, a couple of thoughts. Um one, um, execs context switch a lot and leaders context switch a lot. And, you know, teams, teams that are on the front line tend to be like very deep in the detail. Like assume that the, the leader, the leader you're working with doesn't remember the last conversation that you've had about this, like give them lots of context up front, you know, give them a briefing to kind of intro whatever the topic you know, you, you might be covering with them is and just kind of give them that refresher. Um, I think uh, I think also um, like be clear on what you need from them up front. You know, if this is just like an FYI, I need to keep you briefed in case something happens down the road. Be clear about that. If you need them to unlock funding, be clear of that. that. You know, people often say, don't bury the lead, like be clear up front as part of that briefing, why you're having the briefing and kind of what you want to get as an outcome. Um, I think also like try and ride the middle in terms of just like your, your own emotions, like try and be neutral, try and use neutral language, try and not get too carried away with, you know, you know, this is awful or this is awesome. Um, you know, executives in general try and maintain that neutrality so they can be objective in their decision making. So if you go in with too strong of an emotional perspective, that can often be slightly kind of jarring for them. Um, and then just like, remember, they want to help. You know, again, I think folks can get like very worried, you know, from time to time if they have an executive briefing, especially if it's not something that happens all the time. But like these folks want your company to be successful and that happens by you being successful. So just try and remember they're on your side. Would you mind sharing an example of an experience like this that you've had in your personal experience at Atlassian where you had to, um, where you didn't necessarily have executive alignment, but you worked around to still like go for the partnership? I've had a couple of meetings where, you know, uh, where some of the leadership team might not have really understood the kind of long-term rationale for some of the work that we were doing. Um, but thankfully here, teams are given like a lot of freedom to operate, you know, so we were still able to proceed and then eventually kind of show the value that we knew was actually there. So you might get some questions like that from time to time, which are more of the look, I don't really know why you're doing this, but I'm going to trust you to make the right decision type thing. So again, you know, you really have to be buttoned up going into those sessions and make sure you've gone really deep on kind of the data and, you know, uh, thought about other options that, you know, you may have, you may have should have considered. Um, so again, just like going into those sessions, having done your homework can be very helpful. Got it. Um, to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at, the current um, macro environment of technology and SaaS in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a challenge and a change for many companies recently. What kind of impact do you think this will have on the partnership community? 
A couple of things. I, I think I think projects are probably like across the board, not just in partnerships. We're going to get more scrutiny around the return on investment. Like really, like do we need to invest this uh, uh, and in this way? Like does it need to be upfront? Can it be spaced out? Are we very clear on the return? Um, are there other ways to do this that you know might have a higher ROI? So. I think those conversations are probably going to happen and going to happen more frequently. Um, again, we might be asked to do more with less, you know, so if you thought you were going to hire another couple of developer experience people, maybe that's not going to happen. Same for kind of partner marketing or maybe product management, depending on how your partner teams are structured. So we'll probably have to get better at doing things like prioritization or maybe even sequencing things a little bit differently. So you know, that's definitely something that that I could see happening kind of across the board. I think ultimately, though, like our customers are still going to have asks for us and needs for us. Um, so while we might have to work a little bit differently, I still think, you know, we'll all have very full plates and full roadmaps in terms of projects and programs that we're going to want to ship on behalf of those customers. And to kind of pull on what you just mentioned, like there's still going to be asks from customers for integrations, for those partnerships. Are there any other um, things that you would share at, for to add to the argument for the investment, the continued investment in partnerships, even in these uncertain times? Yeah, I mean, if you think of the value partnerships teams provide, they're, they're all things that are very important to customers. So an integration is gonna help the customer experience. It's going to ideally help make your products more sticky. When all of that happens, you're going to reduce churn or potentially unlock new features, which is going to help with kind of revenue or maybe even, you know, an, an, an upsell of some kind. So I think all of our work can materially contribute to the kind of goals and KPIs that are getting, you know, even more important now, even though they were important. I think anything that links to like customer satisfaction and churn reduction and stickiness is really really important so i think they're all the areas that are kind of would be helpful to take into like prioritization or kind of roadmap planning sessions yeah and and i understand from many of the interviews that i've done that sometimes tracking that attribution to partnerships is a is a challenge to show really the the result of that investment are there, is there any, I know this is a loaded topic yeah. um, that we probably can't um, answer in this one session, but is there anything that sticks out to you or that you've learned in, in your time in product partnerships around some of the best ways to make sure that that attribution is happening? Yeah, we, I mean, we never have enough data. Um, I would say like it, it involve as many teams that have some kind of data competency at your organization as you can you know sometimes that's a growth team sometimes that's the product team that can kind of instrument some of this tracking sometimes it's a kind of uh, like a, a marketing team or if you're very lucky you have some kind of data science support um, but kind of, you know, hunt around inside your organization and maybe even chat to teams that are doing something tangential. Like in the past, if you've worked with a team that kind of does SEO for some of your own marketing content, maybe they can help with some of your partner marketing content. So if there are kind of sister teams at the company that you can leverage, if you haven't got dedicated support, then, you know, they're usually great places to start. Thank you for sharing. I know I know it's a loaded question. Yeah. I wanted to hear your your thoughts and what you thought. Um, that was actually my last question. Uh, thank you so much, Rich, for taking the time and sharing your experience. Where can our audience connect with you? Uh, yeah, if they have Atlassian questions, they can get me at or O'Connell at Atlassian.com. And uh, if they're interested in in reading more, they can have a look at APIpartnerships.com. Awesome. And I'll make sure to link that in the description for everyone's access. Thank you Perfect. so much. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. Nice talking to you.